first, I would like uh, like to give the floor to uh, to Lika. Lika is uh, also a coordinator at DCDD uh, and a policy advisor, and she will tell a little bit about um, about DCDD and the network. Uh, so, Lika, please go ahead. Hi, and welcome everyone. Uh, really good to see you uh, all online. Again, welcome to all of the speakers and all the old friends of this city and of course also new friends. Uh, it's really an honor to have you all here to celebrate our 20th anniversary. And just as it is an honor to be the coordinator of such a wonderful network. DCDD is a network of 10 Dutch uh, NGOs, organizations, and 17 uh, individual experts. And together we lobby for inclusive policies. And together we also learn about how inclusion actually works in practice. And of course, DCAD would not exist uh, without its members. So we are really thankful for all of your commitment over these last 20 years. And today's ce celebration is really in honor of all of you uh, and your partners uh, and for all of the people who work really hard every day to make inclusion a reality for people with disabilities around the world. So thank you for being here. And uh, I'm really excited to hear the speakers to, uh, uh, yeah, to also hear uh, all of the discussions uh, together with you. So Kim, yeah, please go ahead and take us through the program. Yes, thank you. Um, I think Hanek is a bit uh, struggling with uh, putting on her screen, but we'll, uh, uh, I'm sure she will do so in a, in a second. Uh, and then she can also share with us the, the program of today. Um, yes, thank you, Hanukkah. Thank you. Um, so then um, we can go to the slide with the agenda. Yes, thanks. Um, so first, uh, of course, we did the welcome. We already had that. And then we have three parts during the session. Uh, the first one is basically, where do we stand? We have an opening statement by Sigrid Kaag. And then uh, Charlotte McLean, Lapo, and Jetna Bersh Nugusi will give uh, keynote speeches, followed by a QA. and a um, of course, I will also introduce all these speakers uh, once uh, their, their yeah, speech is there, so to say. The, the second part is uh, more focused on where do we come from as DCDD. So we look back at the history of 20 years. Um, it uh, will do together with Huib Cornelia, Paul van Tricht, Johan Weesman, and Lieke Schreeuwen, who you just saw. Um, and that's also followed first by the break, uh, where you can just stretch um, and uh, grab maybe some drinks, um, and then followed by the panel Q&A. Uh, and the final part will be part three, Actions Towards 2030, which is a more of an interactive session on a Mentimeter, which is a fairly easy program to use, but I'll uh, explain that in a bit. And then some answers from uh, Nidhi Koyal, who will also answer these, uh, these Mentimeter questions. And then uh, in the end, we have a, a closing by Gerrit de Vries, who is the chair of the DCDD board. Um, so yeah, as I said, it's a really full program. So uh, let's just get started uh, with the first um, opening statement by Sigrid Kaag. Um, I will just give a brief introduction for those of you who, uh, who might not know who, uh, who Sigrid Kaag is. Uh, she is a Dutch uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Foreign Trade and Development Corporation, and a Dutch politician and diplomat. Um, and previously, she has uh, held high positions at various UN agencies, including UNICEF as well. And we are very honored that the Minister Kaag has been willing to provide us with an opening statement on the importance of, of disability inclusion. Um, so yeah, let's just um, see what she uh, has to tell us. Dear members and friends of the Dutch Coalition for Disability and Development, congratulations on your birthday, 20 years. 20 years of working and fighting for inclusion of people with a disability through international cooperation. This deserves a celebration because we all know that exclusion is a daily reality for many people with a disability. And that's why the work of this coalition is so crucial. Many lives, many people depend on you. Earlier this month, the Youth at Heart virtual forum took place. During a session on inclusion, four women from various backgrounds shared their experiences on what inclusion means to them and how they...
they make their voices heard. I was moved by their personal stories. Aminata Tarore from Mali, for example, shared that no one attended her wedding because of her albinism. This is an extremely sad and compelling example of what exclusion feels like. At the same time, the speakers talked about how their experiences encouraged them to transform not only their own lives, but also the lives of many others. We need powerful voices like those expressed at the Youth at Heart virtual forum. These voices, these women, these men, are catalysts for positive social change. I encourage all of you to continue what you're doing, to commit yourselves, to help others, to be the voice of change, to work, to lead towards a truly inclusive world. And I wish you a wonderful celebration together today and the many years to come. Yes, yeah, so very nice to hear those opening words by uh, Minister Kaag. Um, of course, she's currently very busy, so she couldn't be here today. But uh, Marinka Weingaard is, uh, is present uh, on behalf of the ministry. So Marinka, thanks for being here. And um, I think it's great that uh, Minister Kaag just shows the, the importance of disability inclusion, also in the yeah, more the policy uh, on the policy level of development and also Dutch development more specifically. Um, I think there has been uh, wonderful steps taken throughout the years, but still we have uh, quite a long road to go. Um, so let's just uh, go quickly uh, further with uh, introducing the next two uh, guest speakers that we have here today, uh, which are Charlotte and uh, Jetna Berg. Um, I will give a short introduction uh, followed by their uh, keynote speeches. And after those uh, two speeches, we'll have a Q&A for each of them. Um, so yeah, Yetna Berge Nugusi is a human rights lawyer and she's currently the, the senior manager of the Global Action on Disability Network on behalf of the International Disability Alliance. Um, at the start of her career, uh, she worked at the Ethiopian Center for Disability and Development. And in 2017, Yetna Berge was awarded the Right Livelihood Award, which is also known as the Alternative Nobel Peace Prize. And in order to pass on and share this honor with other women with disabilities, she then in initiated the uh, Her Abilities Award, which is uh, Together with Light for the World, and to celebrate the work and lives of women with disabilities around the world. Uh, so, Yetna Verge, thank you very much for being here today. Um, then for Charlotte, Charlotte McLean Lapo is a global disability advisor of the World Bank Group. And building on her tremendous experience, she works with the operational teams at the World Bank to ensure that policies, programs, and projects take people with disabilities into consideration. And prior to joining the bank, Charlotte served as a USAID's coordinator for disability and inclusive development, appointed by no one less than President Obama. And besides having held high positions at the bank, the South African Human Rights Commission mm -hmm. and UNICEF, it is also relevant to mention that uh, Charlotte was involved in the development of the UN, uh, UN CRPD since the very beginning. Um, yeah, Charlotte and Yetna Bers, thank you so much for being here both. Uh, we are truly honored to have you. Um, and without further ado, I would first like to give the floor to uh, Yetna Bers, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Kim, and uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be part of this celebration with the Dutch Coalition on Disability and Development. Uh, I had uh, the privilege to work with DCDD's coordinators in different times, starting from the time of Lydia with Dicky as well as with uh, Lieke now. I have therefore been able to witness the, uh, the amount of effort as well as the depth of impact that DCDD has uh, put into the international disability inclusive development efforts. As introduced by Kim very nicely, I am representing today the Global Action on Disability, the GLAD network. I would like to start uh, telling you a bit about what GLAD is. The Global Action on Disability, GLAD Network, was established in 2015 in London and is a unique coordination platform for bilateral donors, multilateral agencies, private and public foundations, 
as well as civil society representatives and uh, uh, other other private sector representatives. GLAD in its whole vision and mission aims at achieving disability inclusive international development and humanitarian action. I am so happy to say that your country, Netherlands, has joined GLAD and have been actively participating in different platforms. GLAD, since its establishment, has uh, uh, embarked upon a number of successes that we are here to celebrate today with you. One thing is the Global Disability Summit 2018, where uh, uh, more than 600 leaders came together and uh, uh, promised to increase the pace on disability inclusion. The other very important success that I would love to mention for GLAD is that the OECD DAC marker on the inclusion and empowerment of persons with disabilities. There are more successes that we can talk about GLAD, but I would like to leave you with the note that GLAD is a platform where donors come together to discuss how they can maximize their impact. And we will continue to do so in such a difficult moment where the world is hit by a pandemic, which is also a test that our international cooperation and international development effort was not inclusive enough and resilient to protect the most vulnerable and marginalized, including those with disabilities. As you know, the disability inclusion in development has not been yet a success. Despite a lot of promises, we have less practices that we can dwell on. An important research piece by the Development Initiative released in 2020 revealed that less than 2% of international aid is going to disability inclusion. For instance, in 2018, the, in the investment on disability inclusion was less than $1 billion, which means it was less than one US dollar per person. As you know, persons with disabilities are more than 1 billion. So this is not a great number. But the good thing is that we have now, different from what we had 20 years ago, at least we have evidences that we can say this is happening because of this. So the 2018 aid spending on disability tells us that regardless of the UNCRPD, regardless of the sustainable development goals, which call for partnership in SDG 17, there is still a huge gap in funding disability inclusion. Funding is critical because resources are key in achieving, <coughs> resources are key in achieving our goals and commitments. This same report by this development initiative also tells us that there are five donors who are putting the tremendous amount of money to disability inclusive development. And um, these five donors may be important to name them. One is Finland, second is Canada, Australia, Belgium, and Sweden. I hope Netherlands will make it also to the top five in future commending the number of efforts being done with the, with the uh, government, uh, also with the voices and other initiatives. I want to uh, conclude by telling you a bit about what does your work at DCDD mean for a ruler girl in Ethiopia, where I come from? With the effort of uh, uh, the development organizations who want to be fully inclusive of disabled persons, a water and sanitation project in a given village in Kenya can become inclusive and a girl with a disability will have access to a clean water on an equal basis with other peers. The same is true for inclusive education being supported by development actors. If education is being funded to become exclusive or excluding persons with disabilities, children with disabilities, we are trying to create another world of exclusion, which is another threat. Your work in disability and development paves the road for an inclusive and better world for everyone. The COVID-19 pandemic was a, clue, a clear test 
that all of us need to be developed in order to be called prosperous. I would like to end my keynote by urging you to build on what you have already achieved and call you for a better and more bold approach to make disability inclusive development a practice beyond a promise. I thank you and wish you a very fruitful and colorful celebration. Well, thank you so much uh, for this very interesting keynote speech. Thank you. Uh, I think it's also really good that you reflected upon the well, the, 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 the current issue, so to say, around uh, the COVID-19 um, pandemic um, and how we really must act uh, upon uh, all the challenges that lay ahead. So thank you, Jetna Beres, for this very interesting keynote speech. Uh, I now give the floor to Charlotte. Uh, thank you very much, Kim. Uh, dear friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to be part of this important and auspicious 20th celebration of the Dutch Coalition for Disability and Development, the DCDD. It's truly an honor and a privilege to be virtually connected alongside such an amazing lineup of speakers. I wanted to preface my remarks with a paragraph that you may that may sound familiar to you, to many of you, and let me read it. It reads: We envisage a world in which people with disabilities can enjoy equal rights and opportunities. We believe that everybody gains when development initiatives become inclusive of people with disabilities. Our world is guided by the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and leave no one behind principle of the sustainable development goals. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is the vision of the DCDD. I find it noteworthy, not only because of its aptness as a vision, but also because it's an excellent stage setter for what I have been asked to talk about today. I'd like to center my remarks around the three questions I was asked to consider, and they are, what is the current status of disability inclusive development globally? What has the World Bank done to advance this agenda? And what can we do to scale up our efforts to ensure that all development initiatives are inclusive of persons with disabilities? So let me get started with the current status of disability inclusive development globally. But to do that, I need to take a step back and provide some context. And I'll start with the fact that the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was negotiated during eight sessions of the ad hoc committee of the General Assembly from 2002 to 2006. I was privileged to have been part of that historic undertaking. And I vividly recall that the Netherlands was a very active participant in these negotiations. To date, the CRPD has been ratified by 182 state parties, including the Netherlands, which you know ratified the treaty in 2016, and has developed several initiatives to implement the convention. The almost universal ratification of the CRPD is significant in and of itself, in part because it points to how legal frameworks can and do serve as tools for social change. The CRPD has been instrumental and a foundational treaty. It has been the basis for establishing a robust global disability architecture that includes the Sustainable Development Goals, the Sendai Framework, and a host of other regional and continental framing documents on disability rights and disability inclusion. These intergovernmental and international norms collectively have created an enabling environment for disability inclusive development. And the CRPD has spurred the development of national laws and policies that are aligned with its general principles. Furthermore, organizations of persons with disabilities across the globe have galvanized their voice and agency around these frameworks and are, dive, and, and are driving the change. They are building off of the work of some of your very own colleagues who relentlessly champion disability rights during the CRPD negotiations. And to, and to mention but a few, Marlies van der Croft and your former chair, Lydia Zichdel. Today, the current status of disability inclusive development has been bolstered by a reckoning of these frameworks. Driven by an increasingly highly sophisticated and well-organized network of disability rights activists, 
of scholars, of academics, practitioners, development workers, community workers, lawyers, importantly, parents of children with disabilities, and of course, government officials. They collectively have translated and transported the tenants of the CRPD into classrooms, into courts, into foreign offices, into the UN, into the EU Parliament, the African Union, and they've embedded it into plans and projects and strategies of bilateral and multilateral donors. This is quite remarkable. And yet, of course, work remains in progress. Which brings me to my second point, which is what has the World Bank done to advance disability inclusion? Well, we have developed the disability inclusion and accountability framework, the first of its kind for a multilateral agency. And so, yes, we are very proud of it. It is premised on the principles of the CRPD. The bank also made 10 commitments on disability inclusion at the Global Disability Summit in London uh, two years ago. And we have a suite of evidence-based sector guidance notes that provides evidence on how to operationalize disability inclusion in our projects. But you might still be thinking, well, that's great. You have all these frameworks in place, but how have you impacted the lives of persons with disabilities? And how have you ensured that the rights of persons with disabilities are respected and promoted? And you might be thinking, are we any closer to the vision, your vision, the vision that I started out with? And I would say yes, a qualified yes, but yes, all the same. At the bank, we have started to operationalize these frameworks. And to do so, we have developed tools and instruments like the environmental social framework to safeguard and guide our project design, which now requires disability inclusion to be, to be addressed from the onset. We have a funding mechanism for our poorest countries that has baked in disability inclusion as a cross-cutting thematic issue and requires disability inclusion to be addressed in, in investment projects. Another first for disability inclu inclusive development. So yes, we have come a long way, but we still have far to go. That said, let me share you a glimpse of what I see in terms of reaching the vision. I see increasingly disability inclusion being mainstreamed into projects and operations. For example, in Lima, we see a metro transport project adjusting for disability inclusion. In Ghana and the Gambia, we see support for inclusive education projects that are at scale and take a systems-wide approach. In South Africa, we see work with the National Statistical Office to collect more robust disability disaggregated data. And I see more attention to addressing gender-based violence against women and girls with disabilities. I see the onset of work in Bangladesh to ensure that digital development and jobs are accessible to persons with disabilities. And in Indonesia, I see the benefit of working with partners to ensure that water and hygiene and sanitation is accessible to persons with disabilities. But I also see, as Yetna Bush pointed out, and would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that we're living in unprecedented times with the COVID-19 pandemic. Its impact has been devastating. Around 100 million people are being pushed back into extreme poverty. And many of these people will be people with disabilities. Many of those persons with disabilities are already living on the brink of poverty. And so as we, you, all recommit and calibrate our vision, let's ensure that none of us feel complacent and let down our guard. It is precisely now that we need to stay focused on disability inclusion and ensure that persons with disabilities are being included in all recovery efforts post COVID-19. This brings me to my third and last point. What can we do to scale up our efforts towards ensuring that all development initiatives are inclusive of all persons with disabilities? Well, first of all, we need to invest in collecting better disability data. We need to, we need to document what works, but we also need to document what doesn't work. We need to be deliberate about working across disabilities and ensuring that those persons with disabilities that are even further marginalized are not left behind. We need to recognize the heterogeneity of disability 
and we need to include persons with intellectual and, de and development disabilities more appropriately. We need to ensure that we understand the overlapping disadvantage and the intersections of disability and gender or disability and race or ethnic origin. We need to keep evolving our, anal our analysis on disability inclusion and developing and redesigning tools to support implementation. We need to continue to use the twin track approach to, to disability inclusive development and we need to grow the number of persons with disabilities working in development because we all know that representation matters. We need to empower new leaders to advance the struggle for disability inclusion and build partnerships that ultimately require us to invest in our, our vision. And I would like to close with an African proverb that says, if you wanna go fast, go alone, but if you wanna go far, go together. Happy 20th anniversary to the DCDD. May, you, may your vision come true. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlotte. It was a really nice uh, keynote speech as well. Really like that you also linked to our uh, to our vision as an opening, and also mentioned uh, Marlies van der Kloof, who was also here today. So that was uh, was really nice to hear as well. Um, and also the examples you gave about uh, what what you see is happening on the uh, on the agenda or in the uh, also in the investment projects you were talking talking about, which is uh, very interesting to hear. Um, but then again, I also uh, like that you linked to the fact that we also need to be honest about what doesn't work. I think that's a really interesting point you raised as well. And not, uh, of course, uh, people with disabilities being a homogeneous group or the intersectionality that you, uh, that you underscored. So thank you. Thank you for this speech. Um, I will just uh, see for the chat, um, some people asked, uh, asked a few questions. Um, First of all, maybe maybe it's good to link to uh, to that, Charlotte, because um, we we know that World Bank is also active in the GLAD network that Yetna Bersh is uh, coordinating. Uh, could you maybe also both, of course, uh, reflect on the importance of this kind of cooperation between donors? Do you want me to go first, Kim? Yeah, sure, if you like. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, look, I mean, I think GLAD has been a really important platform. Um, I think you know having a platform where donors are able to share their vision, um, where they're able to um, talk about issues that are pertinent uh, to disability inclusion has been really, really important. Um, so I see a lot of value in partnerships. Um, I think, you know, again, the, if we can come together and, and begin to share good practices of what works, it really is important. It's also an interesting place to think about who's funding what, right? And, and where we're able to pool funds so that you know, we have better traction and, and scale, um, you know, that's definitely uh, very desirable. And I think that what's been important for me is that the, you know, the, the discussions around GLAD have, have also been framed by the CRPD, by the convention itself. Uh, and that I think has been really important. And as a result, what we've seen is that increasingly, as I mentioned in my remarks, bilateral donors are putting in place strategies, their own internal strategies or frameworks uh, that speak to implementation of the CRPD. And then just lastly to say that I think GLAD is a, a direct response to Article 33 of the CRPD, which speaks to the, the importance of, inter, of international cooperation being disability inclusive. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, uh, Jetna Bersh, would you like to, to also add on that maybe? Yeah, uh, well, Charlotte has uh, eloquently put it, why GLAD and how GLAD, but it's important to mention that GLAD also serves as a, a, a peer learning platform for donors to see who has done, for example, the disability inclusion uh, accountability framework that World Bank has uh, worked on is a lesson for quite a number of other GLAD members, including the International Fund for Agricultural Development. So what really makes GLAD unique is that we have donors who are committed, but we also have multilateral agencies who have really practiced uh, disability inclusion. So it's an important learning platform. And definitely, uh, as uh, Charlotte mentioned in her keynote speech, 
glad is a vehicle to travel far together. So we want to, we don't want to focus on the low hanging fruits, rather we want to make sure that Article 32 of the UNCRPD, which is clear about making international cooperation disability inclusive, is lived up to the fullest. So definitely that's a vehicle and it's growing. There is a growing need of joining GLAD from different actors. And I can see that the more we are together, the better we can deliver. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I also maybe have another another question for you, um, because uh, Charlotte mentioned also uh, the importance of, uh, of data. Um, could you reflect a bit, Yetna Berge, on uh, what we can do to improve data monitoring uh, of disability inclusion, maybe? I think that 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 is uh, super critical when we talk about a disability inclusive development, because we know that what is not measured is not treasured. What is not counted cannot be accounted. So it, it, data is uh, critically important if we really want to advance uh, the, the disability inclusion agenda from promise to practice. So that's what I said. One of the tools to collect data on disability uh, funding was the OECD DAC marker which is for the first time included in the OECD markers uh, compendium in 2020, because now we know at least that not enough funding is going to disability inclusion. And that is because of data. We know that uh, persons with disabilities are not benefiting as they're supposed to do. So that is because of data. So I think we need to invest in data and everyone can do that in making sure that any data that you collect have a disability perspective. And there are already tools out there to support us. And I know that the OECD DAC marker is being adopted to uh, some of our GLAD members, uh, such as the Ford Foundation, being adapted to their own context. So this is critically important and we need to invest in that. And that is the only lens that we can see the truth through. Thank you. Yeah, also the importance of context. I think that's a really, uh, really good point you raised. Um, I also see a question from Lydia Zeidel to Charlotte. Uh, could you say a bit more about what is the World Bank doing, especially for disabled people uh, in the COVID pandemic? What does this support look like? Well, great to, to know that Lydia is in the, the audience. So, so that's, that's really exciting. Um, so some of the things that we have been begun to do has been to drive the analytics. Uh, we were very aware that when we look back at other pandemics um, and other crises, like for instance, the Ebola um, pandemic in, in parts of Africa, we found that there really was very little analysis on what this meant for persons with disabilities. And so uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we pulled together a group of professionals, experts, uh, academics, and uh, UN agencies to, to drive a process around developing an issues paper on the impact of COVID-19 on children with disabilities. And we did a very thorough, um, a thorough job of, of, of research and we pushed out a survey that had over 4,000 um, respondents to. So we were able to collect a lot of data on what the impact of the school closures had on children with disabilities and their families. And no surprise, I mean, I think the issues were that there were major stressors on the household. Uh, very often it was the mother who was looking after a child with a disability, teaching a child with a disability, perhaps without the necessary skills. Uh, there were issues around children not being able to access rehabilitative services that they typically access. So we do have an issues paper on um, the impact of COVID-19 on children with disabilities. And what we're doing currently is we're running workshops or seminars in different countries on this, on this issues paper, because we're trying to push out some of the recommendations that, that were made in, in the issues paper. We also then have looked at uh, a separate uh, analysis of what it means for persons with disabilities more broadly. And I think one of the key issues that we are really trying to think about in more depth is the whole issue around access to vaccines and what this is going to mean for persons with disabilities. So Lydia, we don't have certainly all the answers, but we're really trying to think our way through this 
um, and provide the, necess the necessary analysis to our colleagues to make sure that it, it is embedded in projects as we begin to roll out projects um, on, on, COVID, on the recovery of COVID-19. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for also uh, reflecting on that and also the, the lessons learned from, uh, from previous uh, uh, actualities that happened. I think that's, uh, yeah, and it's good that you mentioned that as well. Um, I also see um, that uh, there is a question for um, Yetna Bersh, which is a really practical question from a participant from Ethiopia uh, who's asking who can uh, be a member of the GLAD network? Can we be a member? Could you reflect on that, please? Uh, I don't know by who uh, we means DCBD or I don't know, but GLAD, you can go to the GLAD website and we have criteria for membership. And um, well, it's open for bilateral donors, multilateral agencies, private foundations, uh, doing development projects in developing countries. So I would advise for the detail going into the GLAD uh, website, which uh, um, I'm happy to share maybe later on in the chat box. But um, yeah, I think that that's much better, but it's an open and we have a lot of our resources also available for uh, non-GLAD members, which can be accessed also uh, from Ethiopia or anywhere else. Thank you. But it's Thank mostly you. governments uh, who are joining mm -hmm. this and foundations and uh, multilaterals as World Bank financial institutions and so on and so forth. So it's important that we review the criteria and check whether you fit into that or not. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we'll make sure to also uh, share that website afterwards so people can look into that process uh, if, they, uh, if they're interested in that. Uh, thank you. Um, so then for, for Charlotte, as you said, um, representation matters. Um, could, you, could you say how the World Bank uh, enables more people with disabilities to work in development? Um, and I see a bit more questions. What, what advice do you have for DCD members on that, for, for example? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so I think, you know, the bank has increased, well, first of all, the bank made um, 10, as I mentioned, made 10 commitments at the Global Disability Summit. One of those commitments was to increase the number of bank staff with disabilities. Um, and so there's been a very active um, effort to do so. The bank has what is called the Young Professional Program. And so, and it brings in um, development experts um, who are kind of at mid range of their career. Um, and so what that program did was to bring in some experts on disability inclusion to look to see what are some of the barriers that might be existing in this, project, in this program that exclude persons with disabilities. And so that was very helpful to really get a good understanding of what are some of the blockages. So that has, you know, that those recommendations have gone forward. Um, and as a result of that, the new cohort of young professionals include an increased number of persons with disabilities. What's also important is that the bank provides internally uh, support for persons with disabilities. So we have what is called the Disabilities Accommodation Fund, and that supports uh, staff with disabilities to ensure that they can uh, you know, op um, operate um, to their best um, potential in terms of reasonable accommodations. So it will provide screen readers for you. Um, you know, I use a wheelchair, so it provides a desk that's higher so that I can, I can roll under it. So there are supports within, within, um, within the bank to ensure that it's not just about bringing staff on board, but it's about retaining staff and ensuring that staff have a trajectory, uh, a develop, you know, a, a career within the bank. I should also just mention that uh, the bank also has very active affinity groups. So we have an affinity group of persons with disabilities um, and increasingly mem uh, staff members who have fa family members or staff who have family members with disabilities. Uh, so it's it's a very active group, and on the third of December we'll be having some events uh, with these affinity groups, and um, welcome everybody to join those. So I think you know to the question around representation, I would say for those that of you that are interested in working in international development, you know, apply to jobs at the bank. Um, again, there's a conscious effort to bring more staff on with disabilities. So, you know, take the opportunity. It's hard to say how many staff we have with disabilities because we don't 
necessarily disclose our disabilities um, mandatorily. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I see time time flies. Um, let's just go to maybe the, the final question um, uh, that's, uh, I think, actually for both of you. Um, but um, do you see enough initiatives uh, with big and small companies to develop more inclusive products and services that can help people with disabilities to participate better in day-to-day -day society? Um, maybe Yetna you could, uh, could go first briefly and, uh, and then chart up maybe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. So yeah, pri the private sector is one part of the GLAD network membership. And fortunately, the number is not that uh, big, but we aspire to come up with a better number uh, in the coming years, uh, particularly with our new strategic development to start implementation in 2021. Uh, a number of companies have now realized that uh, missing out on uh, uh, adapting to become inclusive will definitely uh, lead them to a loss. So. It's not simply about the rights of persons with disabilities to be included in the companies. It's rather of the company's image of being either, in, either inclusive or exclusive. So um, uh, we have seen a number of efforts uh, on, I would like to go back to the Global Disability Summit uh, commitments that were inferred by the private sector and quite a number of them, including Cisco and uh, quite a number of private sector companies, business, small and big companies, have made a significant progress in terms of uh, uh, implementing their commitments. There is also an initiative called the Valuable 500, which I am very much aware of, uh, where uh, more than 300 companies who are open uh, to uh, 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 adapt their products, become disability inclusive, as well as be inclusive in their human resources, have come together. The, the target is to get 500 big international companies uh, uh, get into this value ever campaign, and we hope that there will be more. But we are, it's encouraging to see that quite a number of companies are really uh, working their best. But I want to leave you with a note that uh, we uh, are faced with the situation that um, now people with, people are convinced, even people in the companies are convinced that disability inclusion is a must. But we as persons with disabilities and as disability and development actors need to support them how to do it. Now we are in the how phase and I hope the next decade to come for DCDD will be a clear support in terms of how they can be more inclusive. So I think the how phase has come and we really need to be prepared to respond for the how questions of this small and big companies as well as development actors. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, maybe Charlotte, quickly, do you have a bit to, to add on that or? Yeah, no, just to say that. Um, so, you know, as as you mentioned in my in the introduction to me, um, I am the Global Disability Advisor for the World Bank Group, which also includes the, environment, uh, the IFC, which is the more um, private sector part of the bank. And um, they have really ramped up their work on addressing issues around ensuring that the private sector is thinking about disability inclusion. Um, they now have somebody who's working full time on this. They have a team there. Um, and, and there's a lot of work going on in that space. So I think, I think, there, I think you know, there are definitely some advancements. Um, in the States, we have a disability, disability colon in, which is, a, which is a network that empowers businesses um, to achieve disability inclusion and equality. Uh, we have you know, former Senator Harkin, who has a big uh, conference on employment of persons with disabilities and a lot of the big uh, private sector organizations are part of that. So I think there are some, you know, there are definitely some inroads that are make, being made in that regard. But as I said, um, there still is a lot more to do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I guess that um, that is it. Unfortunately, we're out of time. And um, uh, also uh, now directly, uh, Charlotte and Yetna Bersh, I would really like to thank you both. I know you have a busy schedule and uh, have to go to a, to another meeting, um, but I wanted to thank both of you for your time, for your very interesting uh, keynote speeches, and also the, the answers to all these questions. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you very you. much for having me. Bye-bye.
Yes, so without um, further ado, I will quickly go to, uh, to Lika, who will introduce the, the panel we have as a next, uh, next part of the session. Uh, so Lika, the floor is yours. Looking for the unmute button. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so I'm really happy to introduce you uh, to our uh, exciting next panel. Um, for this section, we will dive into the history of DCDD and the history of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Our first speaker is Huib Cornelia, and Huib is officially the founder of DCDD, although he was not alone uh, in this, uh, as there was a group of co-founders. Huib is also the director and founder of Enablement, and this is a consultancy specialized in community-based rehabilitation and disability inclusive development, doing research and building capacity around the world. And recently, I also became the editor-in-chief of the DCID journal. And then our second speaker is Paul van Tricht. Paul is a historian, a lecturer at Leiden University, and he's a postdoc researcher in a project called Rethinking Disability. For this research project, Paul has studied the impact of the International Year 1981 uh, on the rights of people with disabilities and on the development of the UN Convention, the CRPD. And our third speaker is Johan Weisemann. Johan was one of the first chairpersons of the DCDD board. He has a very impressive track record uh, as an activist who's been fighting for the rights of deaf people and persons with disabilities, both here in the Netherlands and internationally. And this month, a beautiful biography of Johan's life was published, which I can really recommend to all the Dutch readers here. Uh, the title of the book, if it were to be translated in English, would be troublemaker in a silent world. So now we will first see a recorded video uh, of the first part of our panel discussion. And afterwards, there will be time for questions and answers. So again, please share your questions uh, in the chat box for the Q&A. Thanks. So uh, let's start with the first question. Um, hi, uh, you are, well, the, officially the founder uh, of the DCDD network. Um, so could you tell us something about how it all started and why DCDD was founded? Yes, that's uh, fine, uh, Dikke. Uh, by the way, I'm not the only founder because there were two more founders and I would like to mention their names. It is Marlies van der Croft, an occupational therapist who worked for a large number of years in Pakistan and who was having a strong, at that time already, a strong track record in the field of disability and development. And it is Christina de Vries, who worked at that time as a medical advisor for ICCO, for ICO, uh, and who has been working in the past in the field in Nigeria, in the field of community-based rehabilitation. Now, I think that brought us actually together as three professionals, having a concern that in Dutch development cooperation, both official development cooperation and uh, the involvement of INGOs and uh, NGOs active in, active in the Netherlands, that there was far too little interest and expertise and attention for the field of disability and development. We felt actually ashamed that so few organizations had an idea uh, that people with disabilities were left behind to talk now in, in, in the negative language, which is now turned positively when we talk about the SDGs. But by that time, um, by the way, still, I would feel that, uh, that a lot of people with disabilities are still being left uh, behind, uh, although the situation is now uh, much better than before. I have to say also that uh, by, you know, while being a professional at that time and having 10 years of experience in working in different projects in South Africa, seeing the needs of people with disabilities, I have myself a daughter with a learning disability, so I'm also an activist. 
and we did set up um, and we have been thinking about DCDD um, as an organization that was pulling actually organizations and people together who had an interest, a common interest in the field of disability and development. So right from the beginning, we were seeing DCDD as a lobby organization that's trying to influence the Dutch government, the Ministry of Development Cooperation at that time, uh, but also different organizations. And those years you had strong organizations, big organizations like Oxfam NoFIP, uh, HIFOS, uh, ICCO and Cordate. Uh, so the, the, the focus was those first years very much focusing on getting them on board and getting an interest from, uh, from their side into the field of disability. Um, some of them were responding positively, but unfortunately not all of them. I still doubt actually in terms of how serious uh, some of these organizations were at that time and are still with regard to disability. With regard to the Dutch government, we had long and intensive discussions with the um, uh, Ministry of Development uh, Cooperation. And we try to promote actually the idea of having next to the gender uh, component that had to be in part of uh, development cooperation projects that would also be a disability component. Mm -hmm. it was resistance, you know, we, we felt quite strong about this, but the people in charge at the Ministry of Development Cooperation felt quite strong in terms of, you know, do we need to have another group? Do we need to have another subject to pay attention mm -hmm. to? We cannot ask that from our civil servants because they will be against it. Mm -hmm. So from the beginning, there have been these two pillars actually of lobby on the one hand and at the same time practical uh, experience and exchange and learning also as a network. Yes, definitely. I think the first yeah. uh, 10 years may be, may be slightly longer. It was also in the time of uh, Johan Weseman, we had a number of uh, working groups, uh, a working group focusing on sexuality and disability, a working group focusing on community-based rehabilitation, a couple of more. And um, I think that was a vibrant network also at that time. That was a, a network where people came on a regular basis together, exchanging information, um, learning from and with each other, uh, writing uh, uh, documents uh, which were made public as well. Um, during that time, I have been chairman for a couple of years as well. I've been serving for probably for too long on the board of uh, mm -hmm. this year. I'm not sure about that. But uh, I think there was a tremendous enthusiasm, enthusiasm at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, when you look at our 20th anniversary now, how do you look at it? How do you feel uh, about what we have achieved? Um, is there enough reason for celebration today? Yeah, I think, but the work is still in progress. I think we still need a couple of decades probably before uh, we can uh, say, hooray, this is really uh, fantastic. But we see now within the Dutch Ministry of Development Cooperation or Foreign Affairs, we see a much stronger interest into the field of disability. Um, uh, there, there are more regular discussions actually with the ministry. The DCVD is being seen as the mouthpiece for um, organizations that are active in the field of disability and development. And I'm also very glad to see that a lot of mainstream development organizations is seeing that they have to make sure actually that they become more inclusive in their work. It has been a long process, um, but I think we do need to realize that uh, changing mindsets of society, uh, creating that much needed transformation is by definition maybe a long process. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm positive. I'm very happy with what I'm seeing now um, in terms of the role of DCD and what DCD achieved over the past 20 years. Great, thank you. Good to hear. Um, then we will go to our next uh, guest. Um, uh, Paul, um, DCDD was founded in the year 2000. This was around the same time that the international negotiations started about the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Can you take us back very briefly to that time? Uh, how and why was this new convention actually developed? Um. 
Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, I think the early 2000s uh, were very important years for the struggle for recognizing the human rights of people with disabilities. Uh, the struggle for, for recognition on the international level uh, goes back to the 1970s um, and, and was put forward by disabled people uh, themselves, especially since the 1980s. Um, and there uh, have been several attempts to start uh, the drafting of a negotiation on the rights of persons with disabilities. But in 2001, Mexico was successful. Uh, and one of the main reasons, uh, interestingly, for being successful uh, uh, with their proposal um, was that disability was not included in the Millennium Disability uh, Goals. So that, that, that was helpful for Mexico because they, they could form a coalition um, with the argument we need something separately on disability to bring uh, uh, disability of rights and, and emancipation further. And what is unique uh, about what, what started then, the negotiations, the drafting of the convention, is the high involvement of, uh, of people with disabilities themselves. That's really unique in the history of, uh, of the making of international law. Mm, interesting. Um, there is also a specific article uh, about international cooperation, Article 32, which uh, actually states that international development programs also need to be inclusive of people with disabilities. Um, I understood from some of the, actually the old newsletters from DCDD uh, from that time that uh, it was actually not so easy to get this Article 32 into the convention. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, uh, although I have to say that my, my work on this is in progress, uh, so I'm still trying to find out uh, how the negotiations uh, exactly uh, went. Um, but what I understand uh, at this moment fr from the process is that, especially in the beginning, uh, there was a huge discussion about the type of convention. Uh, so, and, and one of, or, or two of the, the main options uh, were a social development treaty on the one hand and a human rights treaty on the other hand. Um, and uh, at a certain moment, the decision was made in favor of human rights um, uh, treaty uh, or convention. And what you see then that uh, development uh, was part of the first draft uh, of the human rights convention, but not really, uh, really with a separate article, for instance. Um, but um, but shortly after that first draft, development and art Article 32 were included because the, the struggle for a broader human rights uh, convention um, was, was successful. Uh, and uh, uh, then the moment was there to include uh, a specific article uh, on development. So it was, my impression now is that it was uh, a huge point of discussion in the beginning, uh, but um, but not really in the later uh, negotiations uh, mm -hmm. of the convention. Good. And when you mentioned that uh, people with disabilities were very much involved in the in the one well, process of developing yep. the convention. Um, how was the involvement from, of people from this uh, developing countries or from the south? Yeah, a huge uh, involvement. Uh, and, and that's also a longer uh, history. So uh, in, in some popular histories about uh, disability activism and, and the history of human rights, there is the story that it's a Western thing that's at a certain moment uh, went, went uh, to, to the south. But that, that's not true. For instance, DPI, the main international uh, uh, organization run by people themselves, is from the beginning uh, a collaboration of activists from all over the world. And that's also what you see in the negotiations about uh, the UNCPD, that the Global South is really 
uh, a serious uh, discussion partner uh, uh, in the negotiations. Mm -hmm. Good, good to hear that that was from the start. Yeah. Um, Johan, you were one of the first uh, chairpersons of DCDD. Um, what, yeah, what is the most important change that you have seen uh, in your time and maybe since you were involved with DCDD? What, what, what do you see as our biggest achievement? The most important item for me is that disabled people have become much more visible also in international development cooperation. That disabled people um, are on the agenda, uh, are higher on the agenda in Holland, because in the beginning we weren't. And I think the major achievement maybe is not so much in terms of achievement, that, but that the fact that we're on the agenda and that in itself contributes to the items being discussed and people becoming more aware gradually. And I think mm -hmm. that was the major transformation. And I think Hype uh, worded very uh, nicely. It was very hard in the beginning to get disability on the agenda. And the resistance uh, to looking at disability as a social issue, rather than a medical issue, as a human rights issue, rather than a medical issue, that transformation was very difficult. Um, then the process of mm, making society at large um, aware of the fact that disabled people do not only um, have limitations, but are people with citizens with talents who want to participate in society in all levels. That process, that's a, yeah, an art in itself, how to create that awareness. And to be honest, Holland in the, uh, in the early stages was not very active, I would say, internationally, especially not in the field of disability and development. And I hope that that's much more the case now. Mm -hmm. Um, I was, for myself, my personal history, I started uh, as a member of the National Committee of the International Year of Disabled People, 1981. And at that time, it was a very a hard position to have. I think there were only four people with impairments involved in that uh, committee with a lot of counter forces. Uh, for, but I have to think of people like Bas Treffers and uh, myself, just two of the four that were involved. We really had to uh, work very hard to get some awareness and respect for our position. And I'm extremely happy that disabled people, um, also after the year of disabled people, developed a, a movement that became stronger and stronger. And I think the International Year of Disabled People is a real important uh, point globally. Also on the European scale, it led to the development of disability specific programs, the Helios 1 and the Helios 2 program. Um, and to be honest, the Dutch government really did not <coughs> cooperate <laughs> um, wholeheartedly. They really were made a lot of pressure to contributes and enable the international exchange of good practices on a, on a European scale. And to be honest, also disabled people, um, if you look at a global scale, I think Holland was not very aware, very active uh, as a disability movement. So and as the chair of the CDD, former chair, I'm very proud and grateful to the founders that really understood what was at stake here. First of all, an exchange of information between different uh, stakeholders in the field of development cooperation. And 
and people had their own uh, lived on their own islands <laughs> as it were so it was hard to bring people together perhaps that's typically dutch i don't know <laughs> but at least there was some shake up and there was a, a movement developing and of course the ministry of foreign affairs and development cooperation were to tough opponents, unfortunately. Mm. And I think we had, I think I have come to, to the end of uh, my first answer. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm super happy um, that DCD is still alive and strong. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Really good to hear your. Uh, yeah, your perspective, it goes so far back, uh, all the way to the 80s. Um, my other question is, well, you have contributed a lot also to the movement internationally. Uh, I know that a few years ago, you also went to South Sudan to support deaf people in... maybe also reason for for hope that you saw there i'll try to be brief <laughs> <laughs> i understand the time pressure um but guests have been very active uh, on a different uh, level and actually the process of starting the, the publication of the dictionary process started uh, before I got involved. It was Life for the World with very strong support from Uganda who started that process. And my presence um, had as an objective to uh, again create exchange uh, of information, good practices between different stakeholders and also people from different tribes uh, in Sudan which was not very easy. But the training was focused on uh, making people aware of what they shared, despite their cultural or linguistic differences, what they had in common. And that teamwork was necessary and to work together on disability was more important than tribal differences. That was a quite heavy training. And of course, coming there as a, a white elder man was not easy. <laughs> Um, but I think people, stakeholders found each other and started developing their own uh, discourse, their own stories. Uh, no stuff. Uh, so they really um, had to develop their own story rather than copying, parroting what I had to say. So I went there for four trips and well, initially I started with uh, deaf people only. I ended up working with the people with different impairments. And I could do this thanks to, to ah, and I worked with, uh, and it's also I like was able to do this work thanks to an interpreter from Uganda, excellent interpreter. So we had to develop our own uh, international sign, but that's a different story. But it was looking back, I think it was a beautiful process to create uh, cooperation between people from different uh, constituencies in the disability movement and different tribes. In, in a way, they found each other, they found common understanding, common ground. And they started realizing that together they could achieve much more than on their own. And for the rest, some of the training was aimed at how to build connections with the international disability movement and how to develop a political national strategy. Mm -hmm. Nice and very challenging task. Great. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your story. But I want to emphasize that it was done by the people themselves in the group, not by me. Yeah, yeah, that's very clear and also very important. Thank you.
Um, all right. Well, thank you for uh, thank you all for the first part of this panel discussion. Uh, we're going to go for a short um, tea break uh, for five minutes, and then there will be uh, some time for uh, for for all of you for the audience uh, in the webinar uh, to uh, to ask questions. Yes, thank you everyone um, uh, so far. Um, as uh, Lika mentioned in the video as well, uh, we have a short break now for five min uh, minutes. Um, so for Dutch time, that's 4.20 that we'll be back. Um, you can just uh, grab a drink or something and we'll see you in a bit. Um, in the break, we will have a slideshow with pictures from DCDD throughout the years. So uh, you can also make this break a bit uh, informative if you like. Um, but yeah, first, uh, let's take a short break. See you in five minutes. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back everyone. I think some people might um, well come back uh, in a bit, but we can already start. Uh, five minutes uh, goes really fast. Um, I hope you all uh, had time to get a drink and uh, stretch your legs or uh, just go for a small break. Um, yeah, now we have the Q&A uh, session for the panel. So we'll ask different questions to uh, Johan, Huib and Paul live. Uh, this is of course not recorded. So please uh, go ahead and uh, ask your questions in the chat if you, uh, if you have some. Um, and it might be good to mention that um, as we unfortunately don't have a, a sign interpreter that uh, Johan will answer the questions by chat. Um, so please, if you have a question for him as well, just uh, ask it in the chat and Johan can reply in the, in the chat as well. Um, just see if everyone is present. Paul, Huib, Johan, you're all here, right? Hello? Yes. Yes, yeah, good to see you. Um, I Well, let me start by the question for Paul, maybe. Um, uh, I see I've also, um, you've also looked into the role of uh, regional human rights treaties. Uh, for instance, the African Disability Protocol recently approved. Uh, that, is, uh, that is one question. Have you, have you looked at that as well? No. Um, that, that's a very short <laughs> answer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess it is also very recent developments. So my my book of, on UNCPD or the history of the UNCPD stops um, in, in 2006, 2008. Um, but I would love to hear stories about it because um, I have some, uh, some documents uh, that give an insight um, in the involvement of, uh, of actors from, uh, from Africa or African countries, but I do not know a lot about it, and there is also not that much written. So mm -hmm. uh, if people uh, have stories or want me to provide me with insights, also more recent, uh, I'm, I'm happy to hear them now or, or maybe uh, by email or uh, in another way. Yeah, thanks, because uh, related to that, I see that uh, uh, Jorge, who asked the question, uh, he also mentions that uh, I have the feeling that we need to look more critically at whether civil society from the South was really involved enough in the development of the CRPD, and that we may need to be more critical of different local uh, contexts, as you also briefly uh, referred to. Uh, is, is, is that your opinion as well? Yeah, sure. So, so on the one hand, my point is that, that we have to see that disability activism on the international level is from the beginning uh, done with the involvement of the Global South. So, and, and that stories are hardly told. So we, we, we have to start with telling these stories and to do research, uh, uh, for instance, in, in the archives of, of DPI. Um, and that will also give us more insight uh, also when it comes to the negotiations. And I think we also need oral history there because uh, you not always uh, get a real sense of what happened during the negotiations from, from the official, uh, official documents. Um, we need more in-depth and also critical research to see how, how the power play uh, went and what exactly the involvement of, of, uh, of the South is. So totally agree. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of research uh, can be done there. Yes, thank you. Um, maybe now a question uh, to, uh, to Huib. Um, as you also mentioned in the, in the video, um, or well, you were the founder together with Marlisa and uh, Christina of, the, of DCDD. Um, so yeah, especially for you, uh, a very exciting day, uh, I would say. Um, could you just reflect a bit on those those few years? You also did in a video, but how the the whole process started, and you mentioned the the need as well for more of a, a coalition and a, to combine forces, so to say. Is that correct? Yeah. First, first of all, uh, nice to be here, and uh, yes, I'm in the celebration mood, and I hope that all of you are in the celebration mood. 
uh, although I have been saying already in the, 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 the pilot we, which we were doing, the interview which was broadcasted uh, very uh, shortly ago, that, um, uh, that, that there's still a lot of work to be done. I think there's work in progress and I think we have made uh, first steps um, and um, I think Jetna Berst has been referring to the role of the Netherlands already. She was uh, hoping that uh, the Netherlands was going to be part of the um, uh, I think, I think we, we have made steps, but I think major steps in my view st still need to be made. I think disability uh, or disability inclusion is still something which is um, uh, not uh, very clear in the in the minds actually of policymakers, in politicians. I think as DCDD throughout the 20 past 20 years, we continuously had to struggle actually to change the mindsets, to influence, to raise awareness among politicians. And I think with elections ahead of us, I think we have to continue doing that as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. The elections are, uh, of course, coming up as well in the Netherlands for next year. So that's a, that's a good point you raised. Um, I see a question from uh, Maria Brons from Cantales, uh, who is also a participating member of uh, of DCDD, um, saying, uh, "Would you see a critical role for DCDD in the CRPD shadow report, as the Netherlands performance on CRPD will be evaluated sometime soon?" Um, yeah, how Paul, Johan, maybe, uh, I don't know who, who's best to answer this question. Do you have uh, reflections on this? I, I guess there are other people in the room that I, I know that the shadow report in the Netherlands, uh, the lead was uh, at Iedereen. Uh, and I don't know if they have consulted uh, DCDD for this. So maybe Lieke or, or someone else has a better sense uh, of that. Uh, yeah, for the reporting on Article 32, we were definitely uh, involved and we gave the input. Um, for the shadow report, as well as for the report of the National Human Rights Council. Okay, um, I, uh, I also here see a question from uh, Sylvia from Wilde Ganse, also a participating organization at, uh, at DCDD. Um, who congratulates us. So uh, congrats to you too, Sylvia, of course. Um, she is mentioning, are there task groups where members can exchange views and or collaborate together, uh, especially led by uh, people with disabilities uh, abroad? You know, if someone from the, from the panel can or wants to reflect on that? Uh, I post um, Sorry. Yeah, if you can go first. <laughs> okay, yes, yeah. I possibly can say something about this. Um, uh, I think DCD is also a member of IDDC. Uh, I think at this moment, not very. See you later. Can, can you hear me? You can hear me, yes? Yes, yeah, I think I'll have to mute okay. someone. I will do that, sorry. <laughs> okay, no, no problem. Uh, DCD is member of uh, IDDC and member organizations of DDC, DDC, DCD are member of IDDC. And I think within IDDC, there are a number of task groups uh, in which you can participate internationally and which increasingly seek also participation from people from the South and organizations from the South. Um, uh, these task groups, some of them are very active, some of them are less active. The activism depends very much on individuals and the time that individuals do set aside actually for such uh, events. Uh, as, as, you know, you, you were asking actually, how was it in the past as well? And I referred actually last week when Lika was interviewing me also to the different task groups which he had within DCDD. Uh, I still feel that it is a bit of a shame that those task groups don't exist anymore because these task groups were vibrant, we were coming together, we were motivating each other, uh, there were creative ideas coming from these task groups. Uh, but once again, uh, the, the membership needs to make sure actually that these task groups are thriving, otherwise they yeah, suddenly will die out. And I think we need to see a common uh, goal, a common interest, a mutual interest, and then it will work. Yes, thank you. Good point. Um, Alika, would you, would you like to add on that maybe? 
Uh, yeah, it's indeed something we had discussed before uh, for me and um, we sort of came to the conclusion that development organizations nowadays in the way how we work and how we get funded, we are a lot more on task and we really prioritize, um, which also means that there are less people in organizations who have time to actually uh, well participate in all kinds of working groups and networks. And so I think that's something that's sort of affected us also as a network uh, in the working groups, but we do have, well, we developed a bit of a new approach. Um, we still have uh, uh, working groups, but they're more on an ad hoc basis. So we, uh, with our members, we work around humanitarian aid, do we work around food security, around sexual reproductive health, um, inclusive education, um, also data and monitoring. And so, uh, yeah, when these topics come up and when there are important inputs to give on international policy or on um, uh, things happening here in the Netherlands, then we actively involve those members that we know are active in those areas. And so we keep each other informed um, and uh, yeah, uh, different members give different kinds of inputs uh, when needed. Um, but it's not like we have meetings every uh, every month or every uh, few weeks because that's, yeah, it just doesn't work like that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for adding on uh, to that. Um, I, uh, I have asked Johan uh, in the chat already um, if he could, could mention for himself, of course, uh, what he thinks uh, is the biggest challenge that lies ahead for DCDD, but also uh, other NGOs focusing on disability in, uh, inclusion, when we kind of uh, look ahead and take a peek into the future. Uh, but maybe when, uh, when Johan is still uh, working on that answer, Paul and Huib, can you also share your thoughts on that? Maybe first, Huib, as, uh, as you were saying, there's also still um, a lot of work to do. Do you have an example or uh, something that pops up? Um, yeah, mostly. No, I, I do realize in my own work within enablement that sometimes you have blind spots actually in terms of who are now the vulnerable groups, who are those actually who are uh, denied their rights. Recently, I did a study for UNICEF focusing on child labor. And, you know, somewhere, somehow, I had always the feeling child labor and disability, uh, yeah, there's a certain connection. And at the moment that you start studying it, and at the moment that you really go in depth in terms of what now is the relationship between child labor and disability and vice versa, you suddenly get shocked and you think, you know, after 40 years of work in this area, area of work, you know, I, it, it was a complete blind spot for me. So I think as DCD, we continuously need to be aware actually that there will be groups of people who are vulnerable, who are, whom we are missing, um, who are not involved actually in the emancipation. Uh, I was mentioning in the chat in the previous session, do, do we have enough sight, for instance, for children with severe neurological disorders? Do they have a voice? Do we give actually sufficient attention to family carers. I doubt actually. I think that's that's a group which is very often completely left out. So I think be aware, smell what is happening, listen what is happening, see what is happening, uh, whatever. But, but trying to be aware actually for those groups of people. Yes, thank you. I think that also really links to the, the importance of uh, data uh, and monitoring also as well. Um, uh, Paul, do you have maybe uh, also like a, a thought that is a, that according to you and the, the research that you did maybe is a is a big challenge? Yeah, it, I think it's not really up to me uh, to say what's the big challenge. So I would say ask that uh, question. I, I, I would pass that question uh, to, to uh, people with disabilities in the global south. Uh, one thing that I think is interesting from my from my perspective as a researcher, and it is in a way already mentioned by Marlies uh, uh, van der Croft um, when she uh, in the chat she she said something about the paternalistic views towards people with disabilities, uh, at least in in the early period of uh, of uh, the coalition, uh, and I think 
uh, at the moment in the Netherlands, we are in all sort of ways exploring the knowledge of people with disabilities and the relevance of that knowledge, uh, the erfarings, uh, kennis. And I think that that is also, also when it comes to data, very important that uh, people with disabilities have really important knowledge. Uh, and it's not always articulated, it's not always used. And I think that that's, that I would see as a challenge and I would be very interested also to collect that sort of histories and that sort of knowledge uh, from the past. Yes, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for adding on to that. Um, I also see uh, uh, the, the answer from, uh, from Johan to me. Um, he mentions that the biggest challenge in the future is that disability uh, people will be, will understand they're responsible for the position, uh, uh, for their position of uh, in the future. So, so the representation. Um, and he also mentions that uh, please feel free to uh, to send him an email if you if you want to ask questions to him, which is uh, I will also put that in the chat. Um, let me see. Um, Dorothy has here also a question in the chat now. She asked, um, I think this is meant for help. Uh, with your vast experience, 20 years is a lot, almost a quarter of a century. Uh, how, are you, how are you ensuring you are grooming more experts, especially from the areas where disability is not uh, given that much importance? Well, how good luck uh, with answering, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think in my introduction, or in the introduction given by Indica about myself, it was stated that I recently became the editor in chief of the Journal on Disability, CBR, and Inclusive Development. And I must say that that gives me an, a, a position in which I can say also things which I probably couldn't say uh, before. Um, so, so I will during the editorials that I'm writing, but also in terms of the development of the journal, the direction of the journal, I will try to make sure actually that the journal is uh, continuously going to pay attention to people who are living on the fringes of society. Um, th that's one thing. And then uh, within my work, within enablement, we pay a lot of attention to capacity building. We do have a lot of training. We develop a lot of tools and materials to empower uh, people with disabilities and people working with people with disabilities. Yes, thank you. Um... Let me see. I also see uh, many inputs also from people as well who are also uh, well really engaged within this topic and also I think uh, disability inclusion throughout the year. So that's really, uh, really nice to see. Um, let me just have a check. Yeah, for the time, I'm, um, I'm, uh, I think we also have to, to move on. I don't know if for Johan, but also Paul and uh, Huub, if you have any final uh, uh, things you would like to mention or uh, or uh, to include. Not really. Uh, I have not uh, congratulated you officially, so you <laughs> buy congratulations. It is for sorry. Uh, Hope is there anything you would still like to add? Yeah, I hope that there will be a time. Um, I'm not sure if it is in 20 years' time. I doubt, actually, but I hope there will be a time that there is no need anymore for an organization like the ECDD. That would be fantastic. Uh, and I think we are all longing for it, but that means also we all need to be committed to make that happen. I think individuals can make a change. Um, I'm, I'm saying this often when I'm talking with groups of people. If spider webs unite, they can tie up a lion. So if we start working together, forming partnerships, we can even do more. So I hope that, uh, yeah, that we continually um, uh, keep on working actually for uh, the rights um, of people with disabilities, ensuring that they can claim their rights and can claim their entitlements. And I think that uh, gives us a lot of responsibility as much as it gives a lot of responsibility towards people with disabilities. We need to do it together. Thank you. Thank you for that, Huub. Um... Johan, I, um, maybe it is a good idea to, if you have um, uh, things to add still, to feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we can also have the, the discussion a, a bit more there. Um, as I said, it's a, it's a topic I see many people are really uh, 
engaged in. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Thank you again, uh, all the three of you for, uh, for your input here. Um, and also the, the very interesting uh, panel discussion that we just saw. Um, yeah, without further ado, I, I will go to the next, um, next uh, part because uh, we're running out of time uh, quite in a bit, I, I'm afraid. Um, so that is the, the more interactive uh, session we have and the part three, so actions towards 2030. Um, here we would like to ask you um, if, uh, if you could either, uh, you could do this online on the internet or just by grabbing your phone. Um, to go to uh, www.menti.com. Um, so please all grab your phones and, um, and go to that website. And if you are on that website, um, it is uh, asked to put in a code. And the code you can type in is uh, 4009453. Uh, and uh, it's also here on the screen, but I will repeat it one more time. The code at uh, menti.com is 4009453. And I will also ask um, Hanneke, who shares her screen, to also uh, share um, the presentation uh, on Mentimeter, so we can also all uh, have a look at the questions on a big screen. Uh, and on this screen, uh, the code is also there, so you can still, if you if you are struggling still a bit or a little bit slower, you can still have a look on that uh, on that website and see the code. Um, so we'll just wait for Hanukkah to, uh, to make sure everything is set in stone. Yes, perfect. So if you are at this website and typed in the code, which is also on the top of the screen, screen now. Um, the first question uh, can be answered and uh, I will also read it out loud and then you can have a, a th yeah, think about it a bit. Uh, the question is worldwide donors currently spend 2% of their budget on disability inclusive development and uh, what do you think can be the percentage by 2030? So yes, please uh, take some time um, and uh, give your answer. And I see we have now uh, 39 people who, uh, who answered. Um, I hope there are still, uh, we'll just wait for a bit more to come in. Um, so there's no really, not really a, a good or, or false answer, so to say. It's just what you think uh, would be the percentage. Uh, you can also be a bit hopeful or maybe, uh, as they say, a bit more realistic or pessimistic. I don't know what the, what the right word for this is. Um, let's see, yeah, 40 now. 41, so it's going up. It's nice to see that so many people are, uh, are giving their thoughts on uh, what they think. So I, uh, well, I hope at least the people who will say 2% or less uh, are, are wrong. Uh, and it is gonna be the last uh, percentage, of course. Um, let's just wait till we're uh, around 50 and then I think we'll just, uh, we'll just go to the answers. What, uh, I'm very curious about what all of you would reply for this.
Yes, okay, I see some answers uh, here. Okay, okay, so many people think uh, between two and 10%. That's uh, 28 people that, that answered that as a, yeah, as to this question. Three people say 2% or less. And then we have around 13, which is also quite a lot uh, saying, uh, I think between 10 and 25%. Um, and there's one, uh, one person who replied that it's around 25 to 50%. And um, well, the, the, the donors that spend the, their percentage of their budget on disability inclusive development, two people, I hope they're right, will say that's uh, gonna be between 50 and, um, and 100% uh, by 2030. So let's, uh, let's really hope so. Um, yes, I think we can go to the next question. We have three in total. So let's go to the second one. The second question is, what should be the top, so should be, should be the top three priority actions for stronger international policies for inclusive development? And on your screen, you see that you have seven different options. I will also read them out loud. Um, the first is, has to do with sanctions. So donors need to apply sanctions on implementing partners in case of disability exclusion. The second you can answer is a criteria. Donors need to make disability inclusion mandatory for implementing partners. The third one is goals. Donors need to develop concrete action plans. The fourth is data, increase investment in disability data and monitoring, which we have also talked about, of course. Uh, the fifth is focused on participation. Donors need to ensure involvement of disability movement in policymaking. The sixth uh, focuses on support. Donors need to offer tools and capacity building on inclusion to their impl implementing partners. And the last one is capacity, donors need to ensure international staff awareness and capacity on disability inclusion. So you can give three answers and I will let you uh, all think a little bit about these questions um, and, uh, and give your replies. So in the chat, I see that someone mentions that unfortunately for, for her, it doesn't work giving the answers, but she would mention uh, the second one, um, two, six and seven, I see. So that's criteria, support and capacity. Thank you. Um, I hope for the others that the, that the app does work sufficiently or the website. Um, I see 32 answers already. So let's just go to up to uh, to 40 and then we'll, We'll see what uh, what the answers are given uh, given by all of you. Yes, I think uh, we can uh, have a look at the answers. Okay, so let's see what's happening. The first is uh, participation. That's what uh, most of you have answered. Um, so donors need to ensure involvement of disability movement in policymaking. And then a close uh, second, so to say, is, uh, is criteria. So uh, donors need to make disability inclusion mandatory for implementing partners. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really uh, important point as well. And third is capacity. Donors need to ensure internal, uh, staff awareness and capacity on disability inclusion. So after those three, uh, it's followed by data, support, goals, and sanctions. Sanction is not that uh, that many. So I guess, um, well, at least for the 40 people, uh, 44 people that replied, um, 
I yeah, just thought they, they were from these seven, maybe uh, the, the least should be the least of a priority, so to say. Um, so yeah, that's, I think, uh, uh, food for thought um, and um, participation criteria and capacity could be, uh, could be good points to, uh, to focus on. Um, yeah, let's go to the final one of these three questions. The third question, um, and that is, what do we all need to learn in order to achieve disability inclusive development? So this can be something that pops up in your head or according to you, what is something that we all need to learn? And you can uh, type two phrases, two sentences or uh, two words, whatever you prefer. So they will, uh, yeah, they will sh be shown on the screen. I'll give you uh, again uh, a bit of time to, to type in your answers. Good luck. I guess this is a question you have to think about a bit. I see some, some answers already coming in, eight, eight people so far. So two things that you believe uh, we all need to learn in order to achieve disability inclusive development. Okay, um, also considering time, I would uh, suggest to just show the answers. There are many, many nice words uh, on the screen coming up. Uh, let me see. I see listening as a very, very big one. Cooperation, mainstreaming, participation. And uh, the answers are also changing a bit considering the, uh, the answers that are still coming in. Advocate, empathy, action, capacity building, how disability is created, inclusion, which is also an important one, of course, mainstreaming, yes, and participation. Uh, that's uh, very nice to see. Of course, we will uh, happily be sharing these, uh, these slides with you afterwards, so you can also see what, the, what other answers were that were given. Um, and I see from Johan, uh, Johan that he also replied, Johan Wezeman, uh, empathy for disabled people. So that's, a, I think, a really good point. I think it's also been raised before by someone in the chat. Uh, we're not, um, people with disabilities, we're not a separate group, and it needs to be just incorporated into uh, mainstream uh, NGOs, but also the sector more broadly. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for all your answers. I think it's really nice to see uh, what, uh, what each of you uh, but um, I just see that we're, we're going to be a bit out of time. I, I want to mention that uh, probably around 50 minutes. I think it's good to, to state that. So just, um, just to know, um, I can imagine if you cannot uh, make it uh, after, uh, after those minutes, but just uh, we hope that we can still reflect on everything. Um, for the next, uh, next step of this, um, of this Mentimeter uh, uh, to add on. Uh, we have some answers given to these questions also from, uh, from Nidhi Goyal. Um, and I will briefly introduce her before we gonna see what she uh, responded uh, to, this, uh, to these questions, these three questions. 
Um, Nidhi Goyal calls herself a disabled feminist activist, and she's the founder and director of the award-winning NGO Rising Flame, which works for women and youth with disabilities in India. And Nidhi has been globally elected to the Board of Association for Women's Rights and Development, AWIT, uh, where she's currently the president. And in addition, she is uh, on the advisory board of VOICE, a global fund of the Dutch Ministry of Development Corporation. And on top of all this, Nidhi is also India's first female disabled stand-up comedian, which is, I think, a really nice uh, touch uh, to this. And as a comedian, she uses humor to challenge prevailing notions about disability and gender. Um, so yeah, also considering the time, I will just suggest to quickly uh, see what Nidhi has uh, in her video as these three uh, answers. Um, so let's, uh, let's just have a look. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Namaskar. I'm Nidhi Goyal from India. Um, and really, really fortunate and privileged to be have this access of Zoom to speak to you today. Sorry, could not attend the live event and I'm sending a recording here, but I'm sure you had some amazing discussions and reflections on what disability inclusive development looks like. Congratulations to DCDD on completing, on reaching this milestone and everyone who's put in efforts to make this day happen. We were speaking about disability and what disability inclusive development looks like. Who are persons with disabilities? And I'm sure you're tired of listening to, we make up 15% of the world. Yes, 1 billion people with disabilities live amongst us, including me. We're talking about this largest minority in the world, but what does this largest minority face? The first, and very ironically, they face invisibility. We face high costs of living because of infrastructural, attitudinal, and many more barriers filled in our environment. There's very little investment in the development and growth of persons with disabilities, very little investment in their education, very little hope from their employment, very little confidence and faith in them. There's of course higher vulnerability and much, much, much higher vulnerability, not just to discrimination, but to abuse, to violence, to unsafety. People with disabilities, yes, are disproportionately impacted because of lack of all of these above factors, but also lack of inclusion in policies, invisibility in systems, um, and so on. They're really left out of development gains. And that is why the need for thinking about disability inclusive development and this urgent need to carve a future and what this inclusive development future would look like is important. We have committed to agenda 2030 of leaving no one behind. But what are the steps that now more than ever in this moment of crisis that we need to definitely take that we build back better, we build back an inclusive world where no one is truly left behind. You know, I was very fortunate because I wasn't sitting in the audience and answering the three questions, but the questions have come to me. And a response to the first question, what does it mean when we talk about percentage of funding? And what's the percentage of funding that ideally should go to disability inclusive development? I think the question for me here is what is the access for people with disabilities? This is not just an access to funding. We're talking about access to equal opportunities, access to growth, access to safety, access to dignity, access to life, and many more such forms of access, which are important for full and effective participation, for living in the community, for having an opportunity to grow like anyone else. I'll share a little short story um, before I respond to what I think would be the percentage um, or should be the percentage for the future. I was working and heading, uh, working at a nonprofit based in India uh, before I founded Rising Flame, which is an organization where I'm the executive director now. Previously at this nonprofit, I was heading a program on disability, sexuality, gender, and violence. And one of the funders and really progressive and supportive funder of women's rights came to our office and, I, and I, they, they were, their thematic um, 
you know, interest was violence and violence against women and, and combating violence against women. And I give this very pres intense presentation about violence against women with disabilities. And they were really moved. They gave me a substantial chunk of their time to make that presentation. They really asked questions, they engaged with the content, and they said, we did not know, and thank you so much for bringing this um, important issue of violence against women with disabilities to us. And it's really, really sad to know the situation. And then they said something which both wanted to make me laugh and weep at the same time. They said, oh, this is correct, and we're really sorry for everything that's happening, and something must be done. But now can we speak about violence against women? Because, you know, we support violence against women and normal women, regular women were all in the subtext of this conversation. Um, so the question for me is, what do we understand by disability inclusion when we're, you know, different actors in the development space? And here, because the question is about funding, um, you know, it's really not about the percentage. If you had to look at people with disabilities make up 15%, somebody would say, okay, 15% is great, then that much of funding should definitely go. If we say disproportionately impacted and have very, very, very little social protection and support or societal support, infrastructural support and need additional support, somebody would say 25%. But when we talk about disability inclusive development funding, Inclusion is not an option. All our funding should be disability inclusive. Yes, disability specific could be some, but disability inclusive has to be all. Because when all of us as different stakeholders, me as a woman with a disability, as a civil society actor, as someone who works within UN uh, spaces, et cetera, you as a funder, somebody else as, as a, as an academician, all of us committed to disability inclusive need to be th thinking about being disability sensitive, aware, and then inclusive. You know, everybody says there is an idea of a temporarily able body and so we all should be sensitive because maybe one day we'll get a disability and I don't think it's about us getting a disability or not. It is somehow about opening our eyes, and it's very ironical because I'm blind and people are like, what are you talking about opening your eyes? We somehow have to remove the invisibility. We have to combat the stigma that we may have internalized around people with disabilities, being different, being not enough, or you know, constantly having this framing of, oh, but they need special funding, they need special support, they need special something. We just need to remember that people with disabilities deserve equal access to gains, to support and opportunities. Um, and really, you know, when as Rising Flame, I launched in India, the first of its kind, a unique leadership program, a national level leadership program for women with disabilities. And when people said, oh, this is the first of its kind, um, I paused and I said, I, you know, it's ha I'm really glad, but I'm very, very sad because why isn't leading from the front not viewed as quote unquote normal for people with disabilities? Having dis disabled leaders in many ways and contexts is, um, is unusual. And that really helps me segue into the second question. What are the steps that should be taken on priority to ensure disability inclusion or disability inclusive development? Again, as a privileged uh, privilege speaker, I don't have to make the choices. Um, I, if you had to ask me, if you had to ask me on these multiple choices, you were forced to choose three, I would say, I just think all of them are absolutely important because we've waited long enough and it's urgent to start the action now. It's not enough to talk about it. It's not enough to discuss it. It's not enough to say, hey, but we're only starting. We need to start and we need to pick the base right there. Rapidly take steps going forward. Um, but what this question also tells me is that we need to create spaces where all the stakeholders in the development process need to be accountable and hold each other accountable, be accountable to themselves and to others. And this interconnectedness and interdependent accountability is something that comes up for me from here. 
But if you had to ask me two absolute things that are important for disability inclusion and disability inclusive development, I would say data. Data is really important because mostly the questions that are asked to us is where are you guys, right? You people with disabilities, and I really enjoy that uh, because I'm like, yes, us people with disabilities. Um, it's also the question, where are you? What's the issue? What are you facing? Where are the barriers? And it's all a circle, but maybe we should also begin sometimes with the data to say, hey, here we are. And data is not a very, you know, we need to get out of the linear understanding of data. And what I'm speaking about is sort of data in every form, right? Not just a strictly large census type or quantitative data of massive proportions. We need to respect data and see and visibilize um, experiences, visibilize realities. And the second very strong step for me is in an inclusive development process, nothing about us without us. The mantra of the disability movement, but also something that we need to all remember. We cannot work for disability inclusion without consulting, including, and having disabled people at the helm of these initiatives. It doesn't mean that the onus is only on the disabled person, but it also does not mean that this can be done without them or with them tokenistically included. So for rapid progress, two points on data and nothing about us without us. With the last question, I'd like to end my thoughts and reflections here um, on steps going forward. We're thinking about what do we want to learn? And I'm so glad because advocacy is one, but learning is a, con you know, is a process and, and learning is a constant in our, on all our lives. Um, my disability taught me a lot. My disability taught me innovation, adaptation, negotiation, and so on and so forth. I always say I saved millions of dollars, not millions, but lots of dollars, because that's what, um, uh, that's what is taught in uh, B schools uh, for MBA degrees with a lot of money and effort and energy and time. Um, but my disability simply taught these to me. And so learning is a constant and we need to learn and what is it that we need to learn when we think about inclusion in policies, inclusion in spaces? I feel for me, it's one and the primary one is that empathy is not a milestone. It's not like you've achieved, oh, now I'm empathetic, right? And I understand and I'm empathetic. Empathy is a process. Empathy is a process because today you may understand what disability means. Disability, first of all, is not a homogenous group. So you may understand what blindness means or, or what deafness means or what cerebral palsy means or anything else, right? Intellectual disability means. But empathy in, in of itself is a process because today I may understand, okay, now I understand these disabilities. I understand largely what reasonable accommodation enabling environment means. But tomorrow I may come across an indigenous person with a disability and I may not know their realities. Um, or I, I may not necessarily have acquired, um, you know, enough within me to empathize fully with the barriers they face, empathize fully what they would need for full participation. You may know, you know, in general about people with disabilities, but you may not know about women with disabilities, or you may not have met, or you may not have been fully empathetic to gender disability issues. And so empathy for me, is a continuous process and linked to that is the idea of intersectionality. I'll again end with a little story here. And this is of Funder, so perhaps many of you would relate to, uh, with it. Uh, many of you would have faced this. Um, last year, I realized that one of the global leading global funders on disability, um, one of the members of the funding teams, was going around telling close networks of mine that Nidhi is actually not, you know, I identify as a disabled feminist. And that's what I say. I'm an activist working on disability rights and gender justice nationally, regionally, globally, but also a disabled feminist. And that's how I am in spaces in women's rights movement. That's how I'm leading, um, you know, just conversations within women's rights movement, disability rights movements and other movements. So the, new, the, the, the information that reached me that this funder is really upset because according to them, I don't work in the disability rights movement. I work in the feminist movement. And that made me a little upset. But what was my primary reaction was a big, hmm. So we want people to divide themselves. 
we, we do not want to understand maybe the holistic reality. We care little for what we now call intersectionality. But intersectionality is really our life and inclusion is our need. It is not our need, their need, his need, her need. It is just a need because we all stand at multiple axes of intersection. And these intersections are fluid, they're not constant. Before 15, I was a non-disabled girl. Post 15, I became a disabled girl and then a disabled woman. I was partially sighted and now I'm fully blind. At every stage, there is a movement, there is fluidity and respecting this fluidity is, is really important because only then, only inclusion can ensure that we grow together and truly live in this world that weaves and holds multiple realities and multiple colors together. Thank you. I hope you have a lovely day. Yes, uh, amazing to see. Um, I think it's a very, uh, Nidhi is a very inspiring speaker uh, and also reflecting on the importance of mainstreaming disability uh, data, but also the importance of intersectionality. Uh, I think it was a very inspiring and a lot of food for thought for all of us. Um, so let's just quickly move on um, to our final uh, speaker, so to say, uh, which is uh, Gerrit de Vries, who is the chair of the DCDD board, uh, but also program director of uh, NLR, uh, Until No Leprosy Remains. Um, so Gerrit, I would, um, I would really like to give the floor to you to, uh, to say just a few closing remarks uh, before we uh, really close this session. And uh, let me just conclude uh, here by saying that uh, thanks for all that are still here and, uh, and taking the time to be, uh, to be here until uh, also after five. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Kim. And uh, dear everyone, how fantastic is it to be here together with so many today. 20 years DCDD. It was so interesting today to hear about the early days, the passion, the drive, fighting for inclusion. We've heard about policies, about trends, about advice and personal stories. It's interesting to see how much similarity there is between the past and between now. The passion, the many hurdles that, that need to be taken. The togetherness that we feel as a coalition, all striving for the same goals. We have a rich history and many of us have been part of it, each in our own manner. So much has happened in the past 20 years with highlights as well as disappointments, but step, steps have been made. More awareness about inclusion, the UNCRPD of course, more acceptance within the Netherlands government and a growing lens on intersectionality. Though still, still much more needs to be done because as we have heard today, Inclusion is not just an option. 20 years is not enough. It demands much more time. Nidhi Goyal speaks of sensitivity, then awareness, and then inclusion. This is interesting since we can draw a parallel with DCDD. Yes, we have created awareness, and yes, it has led to some positive actions, but we want to see much more action. As Yetnebers said, let's not be complacent. How do we foster real inclusion? What do we need to do? Because our goal is ambitious. It is urgent to start the action and to continue the action. I wish to highlight a few interesting insights that I got today. Johan said, together we can do, do much more. Charlotte said the same about donor cooperation. Translated to the NGO sector in the Netherlands, we need to keep on reaching out to others. Let's find allies, let's work together. I've talked about mainstream development organizations embracing inclusion more than before. Yes, that's true, but still much more can be done. None of the bigger NGOs are part of DCDD, unlike the past. We need to reach out and make it even more stronger. Then the second, nearly all speakers mentioned that data are important in all forms. Data create, creates awareness and our society demands data in order to be convinced and to learn. We need to continue our work on data disaggregation, the OECD DAC marker, and we need to learn from what works and what does not work and continue our lobby and assist the ministry 
to include disability markers and indicators in its programming. We believe there is openness to work on that. And maybe that leads to the Netherlands being part of the top five in the world as advocated by Jetno de Bers today. The third, nothing about us without us remains the core. It's an attitude, it's a way of working, and it's even related to the previous issue of data. Listen to and make sure people with disabilities in the global south are heard. They have the important knowledge and experience that may go beyond our blind spots. And very important, Nidhi Goyal speaks about intersectionality. We are not just a person with a disability, a man or a woman, a black or a white person. We have multiple identities related to so many aspects of our being. So let's see each other in that context as valuable human beings, each in our own context and with our own specifics. Each person matters to the fullest, and that is what inclusion is about. I have had a wonderful and inspiring afternoon with so much food for thought. I wish to thank everybody who contributed this afternoon. First, the participants of DCDD, those who are part participants today and those who have been so at any time in the past 20 years. DCDD is its participants. A big thank you to each of you. And we our mem and our members, we need to remain active. Thanks to the audience who came up in such big numbers today. Thank you for showing interest, for participating. I hope you have gained a lot of inspiration from what you have heard today and will take that with you to watch your daily reality. Thanks to the speakers of today. You have shared so much amazing stories and valuable insights with us. We have learned from you and will take these learnings forwards in the next 20 years. And a big thanks to our preparation team of today, Lieke, Kim, Hanneke. A tremendous lot of hard work has gone into the preparation of today. And the results is what we have been part of today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. A great job, well done. With this, the event of today is closed. Please stay in touch with us. And for those of you who wish to become members, please do so and strengthen our movement because there is still a lot to do. Thank you very much. And I give the floor back to Kim. Yes, thank you very much, Gerrit. Um, I have almost nothing to add. There was a really nice uh, wrap up and also uh, the thanks to everyone uh, that I completely agree with. Um, I'll just ask Hanukkah to quickly show our very final slide. So you can just find our contact details, uh, our website, and also our email address if you want to stay in touch or, or have, still have questions or suggestions, of course, always welcome. And also please note that on this website below at the bottom of the page, uh, you can also sign up for our newsletter to stay just uh, up to date about everything that is happening in the field of disability inclusion. Um, so for now, also considering the time, let's just uh, leave it at this. Um, I just want to uh, mention that we're also working um, in the yeah, spirit of 20 years of DCDD uh, on a video, which will be there at the 3rd of uh, December, the International Day of People with Disabilities. So please make sure you, uh, you watch that as well when it's there. Um, thank you. And then I will uh, just uh, also in the end want to thank uh, our two um, human captioners, Holly and Alice, who did, uh, I think, an amazing job at the live captioning of this event. And um, yeah, yeah, I want to thank you both uh, as well for doing so. Um, so yeah, that, that was it. Thank you all. Have a very good um, evening or afternoon and uh, hope to see you again in the future. Bye bye.